Welcome to Discovering. We'll check out some birds of prey with a visit to the Chocolate Raptor Center in Marquette, along with a snowy owl release in Dickinson County. Then it's back to the blacksmith shop for part three of Forging a Knife. That's all tonight, so sit back, put your feet up and relax. It's Monday night and time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. Black Bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Pretty tough to live in the Upper Peninsula without realizing and appreciating the wildlife with whom we share the landscape. And nature indeed is a way of taking care of its wildlife, but from time to time, a helping hand can be the difference between life and death. A helping hand from people who dedicate their time to rescuing and rehabilitating injured animals as well as teaching others the role these animals play and the value of keeping them healthy. When I picked him up the first day we had a call on him, he couldn't even get off the ground. Um, he was thin. Still pretty alert, but he um, he couldn't take off anymore. He was just, just couldn't do it. So, I mean, he's doing so much better now. Now, snowy owls don't live here. Um, snowy owls are not true migrants. A um, migratory bird migrates back and forth according to seasonal conditions. Fall, spring, you know, robins. Snowy owls do not do that, so they're not true migrants. They are eruptive migrants, and what eruptive migration is, it's a migration that is set off by environmental conditions. The food supply crashes. The snow's too deep. It may be that the food supply was like this, and they had lots of chicks, and a lot of them survived. Now you got a lot more owls, so they're dispersing out, looking for territory, because their parents are pushing them out, maybe. All those additional chicks have now made the food supply crash. So eruptive migrations are set off by an environmental condition in their normal environment. Now his normal environment is the Arctic. And we have three other owls that are eruptive migrants. And that's the Great Gray, the Boreal, and the Northern Hawk Owl. The snowy owls generally start arriving when they do. Some years we have lots of them, some years we might have just a few. You might not see any. Usually they start arriving late November, early December. This year, these guys start arriving in September and October. And researchers, there really wasn't a huge number of nests and chicks. It wasn't above average. So something else was going someplace else outside the research area. And these were almost all young birds, like this one. And they were starving to death. Some of that is the long distance they travel. Some of it is the fact that they are young and they're inexperienced hunters. Of the ones that were taken into rehab in the UP, there were seven. Only three survived, mine and two from the Chocolate Raptor Center up in Marquette. So a lot of these birds did die because by the time a human being found them, they were past the point of no return. Generally, I do not name rehab animals, but once in a while a special one comes along and you have to. This is Uller. Um, Today in modern Scandinavian nations, Uller is a Scandinavian god of skiing. But in ancient times, Uller was the Scandinavian god of winter and the hunt. And since this is a winter hunter, I thought it was kind of appropriate. What it affects really is me because it, it makes me more attached to him. And it's hard enough to release these guys after spending weeks, sometimes months with them, getting back into shape and getting them back out to the wild. Because 
it feels good, but you've become attached to this. We'll check back with Phyllis and the Snowy Owl release shortly. First, it's a trip to Marquette for a look at some more raptors at the Chocolate Raptor Center. Well, here at the Chocolate Raptor Center, we have two missions. Our first mission is to rescue, rehab, and release raptors that are sick or injured. But our primary mission is really education, and especially of young people. We want to get young people excited about the birds, especially the raptors. And that will hopefully last a lifetime and they'll be advocates and protectors of the birds. So I founded uh, the Chocolate Raptor Center in 2012 with my co-founder, Bob Jensen. We have four resident ambassador birds, all of which are permanently injured, so they can't be released back to the wild. Their injuries would compromise their survivability. So they'll be with us forever, and they're all trained to the glove as ambassador birds. This is Phoenix, and Phoenix was our first rescue bird. Uh, he was the first peregrine falcon hatched in Marquette in over 60 years. He was hatched in 2011 at the Presque Isle Power Plant nest box for falcons. And we know that because he was banded, and they banned all our chicks there. So when we got him in, uh, in 2012, we were able to get the band numbers and uh, do the research and find out his history. He had a very badly damaged left eye. We tried to rehab it, but it never came back. And so that's his permanent injury is that he's blind in his left eye. For that reason, he can't be released. And so we've now trained him to the glove as a program ambassador bird. And he goes into schools and other public places, and along with some of his colleagues here, our, our other ambassador birds. And we do educational programs. And we did over 90 programs this year. We reached 3,700 uh, kids and over 1,600 adults. This is Sage. She's our great horned owl. And she's about 20 years old. And she's the grand dam of our, of our raptor center here. We got her from the Wings of Wonder down in Traverse City. She was found as a young owl injured and then made into an ambassador bird because she had injuries. For instance, her left eye is damaged and she's blind. So uh, she's been a good ambassador bird for uh, a long time. She's educated a lot of kids about owls and the outdoors and raptors in general. She's a wonderful foster mom. When uh, woodsmen's or hunters or loggers would down a tree and find owl chicks in it, they'd bring them to the raptor center down there. They were put in with sage. She would uh, take care of them and teach them how to eat, how to hunt. She would help raise them and then they would be released in the fall. And she weighs about four pounds. She's our biggest bird. She's got tufts on top of her head. They're called horns, but they're not really horns. So they show her attitude. When she's mad at us, they go down just like a dog's ears go back. Big talons, feathers all the way down to her feet. She likes her rats and mice and quail every now and again. And she gets mostly small mammals. We feed them what they would eat in the wild. And we get all our, fo our food frozen. So uh, we just thaw it out and give it to them in there. They are very happy. She could probably live to 30 in captivity. In the wild, it's usually half that. It's tough living out in the wild, they have to find their own food. They're, there's not too many predators for these great horned owls, but it can be a tough life out there. She's a magnificent bird. The kids just love her. She's so uh, stately looking. This is, our, this is one of our big birds. This is Eric the Red-Tailed Hawk, so we call him Eric the Red. And he's just two years old. We got him from Traverse City area. Uh, you can see his right wing is damaged. So he was found with a hole in his wing. So he had uh, impaled himself on something, run into something. And uh, the wound healed, but he doesn't have quite control out of the outer, outer part of the wing. So there's some uh, neurological or, or muscular damage in there. So he's uh, one of our ambassador birds. But Eric's pretty happy here. He gets a lot of mice and rats every day, so he's real happy. And the kids love him too. He's very regal looking. He came into his adult colors last year. So the first year they're kind of a brown. They kind of look like a number of other raptors, just kind of brown and white model brown. So they're very difficult to see from far off. But once you get the red tail, it's very evident it's a red tail hawk. And you'll see him around open fields, sitting in a dead tree or on a telephone pole, looking for food. And then he'll swoop down and, and he'll get it. So if you're driving almost anywhere in the Midwest and you see a, a large hawk on a tree or something along the way, it's probably one of these guys. It's the most prominent and uh, populated bird in, in uh, the 48 states as far as raptors. This is Keeley. He's an American kestrel. 
smallest falcon in North America, quite common in the UP. And the falcons, the peregrine falcon, the kestrel, they are all migratory birds. Uh, they don't stay here in the winter because they've got very thin, bare feet, toes, and so they're very susceptible to frostbite. So they fly south for the winter, but then come back in the summer to nest here. And in the raptor world, the girls get to be bigger than the boys. So a uh, little male kestrel is going to be a pretty small bird, but very beautiful, uh, very brightly colored. And the kestrels are one of the few raptors where the uh, plumage is very different, strikingly different between the male and the female. The female's got a dark back, uh, also beautiful, but not like the bright red back that uh, the males have. So he was brought in to us from the Curtis area with an injured eye that was all swollen. We treated the eye, the swelling went down, it looked normal, but he never regained the sight. Uh, and now that eye is uh, drying up and that's his injury. So he's now a program ambassador bird also. But he likes his mice, he gets two mice a day and he eats almost uh, 25 to 30% of his body weight in mice every day. And the falcons have a very high metabolism they eat uh, a lot of food relative to their size, uh, much more so than the owls, which have a somewhat slow metabolism, at least relatively speaking. So this is our infirmary. And this is where we take care of the birds. We do our exams here, uh, any medical procedures. We have two intensive care cages, which are small. And the birds, when they're being treated for medical conditions, uh, oftentimes we have to treat them daily. So we keep them in these small cages where they can't move around and hurt themselves and where we can grab them easily. So right now we have a small northern solid owl who's brought in with a head injury. He's got an injured eye. We're treating him daily with an antibiotic, uh, see if the eye heals, and uh, then feeding him up because he was very emaciated from not being able to fly and hunt for a couple of days. But he's been eating fine on his own now, and we'll see if the eye heals. If it doesn't, uh, he'll be a candidate for becoming an ambassador bird, but if it does, he'll be released back to the wild. And uh, you'll see each one of our birds has a very roomy cage out here, a mew we call it. And so they free lofted in there, but once we take them out, we use falconry methods, uh, put them on a leash, they have anklets on, and this is to keep them so that they don't fly off and, uh, and have a rough time in nature. Because each one of them is compromised in some way, either by sight or f uh, flyability, and uh, they wouldn't be able to survive in the wild very long. So we are a, uh, the Chocolate Raptor Center is a 501c3 nonprofit. So any donations go to take care of the birds. We have no one who gets compensated in any way for their work, it's all volunteer. Uh, so any donations are tax deductible. And we get tremendous support from the community and we really appreciate that. One of the advantages of being a wildlife rehabber is you get phone calls when people think an animal's in trouble, even if it's not. So that's how I get to be able to see things like snowies. So a lady who lived out on the Upper Pine Creek Road, she couldn't, unfortunately couldn't be with us today for the release. Um, she called because the bird was on the ground and she said it wasn't flying. So Walt and I went out, check it out. Sometimes they fly off when we get there, we don't worry about it. Well, this one couldn't get off the ground because it was too weak and tired and thin. Uh, we went, picked it up. I said, that's too easy. Felt his keel and I said, he's very, very thin. So that's why we brought him in. So basically a phone call to a wildlife rehabber brought the bird in and saved its life. It probably would have been dead within the week if it hadn't been picked up. The other part of rehab is now, the good part of course, releasing them. When you release an animal, you don't just say, oh, it's a wild animal, take it out in the woods and put it in the woods. You have to consider that animal's, that species environment. This is an Arctic bird. Where he comes from, they don't have trees. It's big open areas, rocky outcrops they'll sit on, maybe a stunty little bush someplace. And they're also, this owl is diurnal. That means he flies during the daytime. Where he comes from, it's daylight all summer long, 24 hours a day. So we're going to release him early in the day. 
you know, I picked this area out here. We've got a lot of open farm fields. You know, and like I said, he's from the Arctic and he's from places that are open. So there's a lot of diverse open areas out here. And I could have picked a farm to pick, put him on, except that there's a lot of homes, domestic animals and stuff right here. And for his first day, I want him to have as quiet and a private place as he could. So we're going to take him to a piece of property that has these features, open fields, farm fields, etc. But there's no homes right here in this general area. But when he disperses, he still has very good open habitat with all this farm area around us to disperse to. Well, Uller, it's been a pleasure. I think after handling you for the last couple weeks, you've learned a healthy fear of a human being. So, I'm gonna miss your butt. Just take care of yourself and good luck. I once again found myself back at the blacksmith shop for a look at the final steps of finishing the blade. What we'll do is we'll put the, put the knife blade inside the kill here. What's going to happen here now is uh, it's going to start ramping itself up to uh, 437 degrees for an hour. Then from there it'll go into the second stage and then it'll go from 437 up to 1475. The chances are uh, there'll be blisters all over the steel. And to combat that, I got an argon set up here that makes an inner atmosphere inside there. And it'll combat that blistering. We take and hold it for at that temperature for approximately 20 minutes. At that particular point, I'll open it up, take the knife blade out, and put it in 100 degree uh, tempering oil. Okay, here we go, 1475 and 100 degree oil. And we go back and forth with the blade. You, we don't go against the side of the blade. If I go the other way, you run a chance of warping the blade. In heating the oil, it, uh, it cools it faster than it would if it was cold oil because of the viscosity of the oil. Thinner the oil, of course, by heating it, the faster it gets rid of the heat up to a point. Some people say, well, why don't you use water? Well, it would be too severe for this type of steel. You use water, you more than likely crack it. Now the blade is, is hardened. So then we got to draw some of the hardness out. So we uh, punch in uh, a 260 for the first hour, then we go over to 400 for the second hour. Then I'll take it out and I'll just leave it go down to ambient temperature. At that particular point, I can take a dull file, slides over the blade, a sharp file, it should start grabbing a little bit. We had this blade up real nice and shiny, but that's when it was in a, in a soft state. But after heat treating, became very hard and uh, in the heat treating process of course it, there was some distortion on the blade not much but there was so I had to go through the whole finishing sequence again I had to go through all the different belts and now I'm going through the different compounds okay now we'll go to a second stage here different wheel 
Don't ever try to buff going in the edge. That wheel will grab this thing and take it right out of your hand. God only God knows where it's gonna end up. Believe me. <laughs> okay, the second wheel, it's done. And I go to a light, real light uh, compound. Still needs a little bit of final polishing, but I'll do that after I get the handle put on it. These are all the components that we're going to be using to make the handle. The first thing we'll be doing is cutting a piece of brass off here for the hilt. Be doing the same thing with all these other spacers here. All these hilts will be uh, silver soldered on. Then I'll take and make a spacer out of this here. This is my card of paper, different colors, red, white, and blue. Then uh, I'll take a piece of this. It's a man-made material. That'll go there. Then there'll be another one of these spacers going here. Then there'll be another a thin brass piece that'll be going here. The white tail antler handle will be going on here. That's a that's gonna be a real Uper handle. And we already cut the cut the slot in there for the for the handle for the go over the tank. Once you get all these spacers cut and put in place, then I'll take it take them all apart, take them all off of here again, then I, I epoxy every one of them, put them together, put the whole thing, then I fill this with epoxy, put the whole thing together. When it's all epoxy together, I let it set overnight, drill a hole, and then I put a brass pin in there. I probably wouldn't really have to do it, but I do it anyway to make sure that, you know, somehow or another the handle could come loose, which I doubt very much it could, but it just safeguards against that. And then when the whole knife is all done, I can take this here and I can round this off, make a nice round button on the end here, and then I can scrimshaw a buck's head in it. This here knife here, this is really old, but you can see where this uh, buck's head uh, scrimshot in there. Be sure to tune in next week for the final segment on forging a knife. We'll get a look at the finished knife and find out how the sheath is made. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Discovering.